delighted to have Silvana Tumasele here um, as our opening keynote speaker today um, for the new, um, new Voices talk series, Women in History on Education. And um, Silvana is a historian and fellow of St. John's College at the University of Cambridge. And she's also Sir Han Harry Hinsley, lecturer in history, director of studies in history and HSPS. She's one of the most recognized Wilson, Wilsoncraft scholars and author of the book, Wilsoncraft, Philosophy, Passion and Politics, which was published at the beginning of the year. And um, this excellent book has already been reviewed numerous times. And um, yeah, I'm delighted to have you here today. Well, thank you very much. And apologies to all of you for wasting your time. I simply can't understand what happened. Uh, let's hope everything goes smoothly, smoothly um, from now on. So uh, many thanks to, to Clara for um, her patience and for asking me. I'm delighted to be able to talk about Mary Wollstonecraft today. I just want to begin by saying something about the, the book and how I came to write it. Um, I want to really, I hope for a discussion rather than to uh, you know, pronounce on Wollstonecraft or um, her views on education. I had written on Wollstonecraft in a number of publications and from a number of angles over the years, I came to appreciate the vindication of the rights of men um, to a greater extent each time I came to discuss Wollstonecraft. It seems to me the most important work, it was written in great haste, it is unpolished, it is a diatribe, it is an attack on Burke rather than a vindication of the rights of men or a praise of the French Revolution or the French Revolution as it had unfolded only up to um, 1790. In this attack on Burke, which is an ad hominem attack, she consulted her, his um, essay on the origins of ideas of the sublime and beautiful, in which she, um, is, it is well known, uh, found um, his account of beauty its association with women and the view that the notion of beauty in contrast to the sublime evokes uh, fragility, evokes weakness to uh, cut uh, to the chase. And in which he says that women being aware of this, um, feign being weak and uh, they totter and they stutter and their lips, and Wollstonecraft clearly took great exception to this. This was uh, very much in her mind when she wrote The Vindication of the Rights of, of Men. And when she came to write The Vindication of the Rights of we Woman two years later, it seems to me that she continued her diatribe against Burke and his conception of, or rather his rendering of uh, the, the current uh, conception of femininity. It's not clear that he actually held this view um, himself, but um, the view of femininity uh, as, as weak and promoted a, a conception of womanhood in contrast to that. And in so doing, she reached to notions which of, of idealized manhood, of courage, of strength, of independence. These were not qualities that she, she thought men actually had any more than, than women, but these were qualities that she was concerned women to aspire to. So if we then go to the subject of education, which is the topic of this series, very interesting, then her conception of education is clearly one of the mind and the body. Crucial to this conception is exercise, 
is exercise of the mind and exercise of the body. She thinks of the mind, and this was not entirely unusual for the period, as a kind of muscle, one might say, something that needs to be exercised. So education for her is not a question simply of acquiring uh, knowledge, um, the, the three R's, writing, reading, that kind of thing. Of course, it is that. But it's important not to think that what she wanted for women was the same education that men were, or boys were receiving. That's not because she didn't want that, but because this was a very tiny part of her conception of education. So her conception of education, it seems to me, and of course, you know, there's a, a, a very large scholarship on Wollstonecraft, so I don't claim that I'm making uh, great um, discoveries here. Um, her view of education is character building. We need to be strong in mind, um, emotionally and, and, and physically, and a proper education for women, as well as, as, as men, is one that develops traits that develops resilience. Maybe we're slightly more open to this kind of view of education given COVID, but um, it certainly is her view, not least, of course, if we rem remember conditions um, for women, uh, if, if not for the entire population in the 18th century. As you all know, Wollstonecraft herself was to die of following, giving birth to her second daughter, Mary Shelley from, uh, of Septicemia. So um, being physically strong is, is, is not a luxury. It's not like going to the gym for us today, perhaps. It's, it really is um, a matter of, of, of life and death. She herself enjoyed um, Walking in particular, she liked riding, uh, but walking seems to have been the, her physical activity that she liked most. And it seems to me, whilst it goes trivial to say this, or it might seem trivial, it's important because it shapes, I think it gives us somewhat different emphasis on her aspiration for uh, women and human beings in general. Um, it goes with, in my view, a view of um, the unity of mankind. It, it isn't that Wollstonecraft wanted a kind of homogeneous population the world over and the abolition of difference between individuals, including between the sexes. But what she certainly did have is an idea that we must all be as strong and resilient as we can be in view of life's vicissitude. So to my, my final comment is that a dutiful parent, a dutiful pedagogue is one that prepares individuals for a life that is in all likelihood to be extremely challenging. And that kind of education, it's true that she thought women didn't have uh, even a minimal education, but that was the target. And maybe I will say just one more thing is that the emphasis on her as a theoretician of rights and advocate for women's rights and men's rights slightly blurs this because it puts an overemphasis on, on the political. I am not suggesting that Wollstonecraft didn't want political rights. And what I want to suggest instead is that it's important to take her in the main 
to think of her as thinking about human beings within the family, within civil society, and of course, to a degree, partaking in the politics of the community. But it's important then not to simply think of her as wanting women to become citizens only. And I'll end on this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And um, I've uh, prepared um, some interview uh, questions uh, for uh, Silvana for today. And um, I've uh, got uh, some slides. One second. Um, yeah. So, no. Um, um yeah so um i'm i'm so happy um about um this theme and, and that you're here after having written this book because it really aims at why i chose this uh theme for the new voices talk series so um new voices is a group um, for um, emerging scholars internationally who work on women in the history of philosophy and the sciences. And um, yeah, I think that the theme of education is just such an important uh, topic. And, and for me also with a view, not only um, with a view to how do women need to be educated, but what does it mean um, to have proper education for the human being and therefore uh, for women also. Um, yeah, so I think that uh, this is a really great uh, theme to start with, um, therefore. And um, my, my uh, first uh, question is, so you very much portray uh, Wollstonecraft as a philosopher of humanity. Um, what is it in your view that makes Wollstonecraft an intellectual worthy of reading today? Well, I think I've touched on this in the few comments I made just now. Um, but principally, I think it is the way in which she thinks. Well, Wilson Craft is intellectually as honest as um, I think an intellectual can be, or at least um, very self-reflective, um, acknowledging rather awkward uh, positions, revising her views, uh, moderating them, if, if that's the word, uh, in the face of experience, um, by contrast, accentuating them, or one might say radicalizing them in the face of further experience. So she, she's alive to the world and she responds to it. She happens to be living in... Um, what is so, sometimes called interesting times. So there's a lot happening um, politically, socially, and she travels. Uh, she goes to Ireland, she goes to Portugal before that, she goes to France, she travels in Scandinavia. So she is uh, a woman who has a, a range of experience in that sense. And then of course, has comes from a rather a difficult family background. So as a human being, uh, she has much to offer and her reflections on the world um, mirror that. So that would be one thing that she is effectively alive to the world. And I think it's important to engage with uh, authors from whichever period who are very much engaged with the world and a world that was changing very, very rapidly, we think of ourselves, our world as changing very rapidly, which uh, it is, but sometimes think of this in contrast to the past, and there certainly were periods, 
and the late 18th century was one of them, uh, in which individuals had to reflect on the world, if, uh, those who wanted to uh, think about it, in um, a, a world that was um, changing very rapidly and in completely unexpected direction. So that's one, one reason. Um, I, there are many reasons, but I'll, I'll just mention one more. And that is that she did not think, as she wrote in the Vindication to the second edition, sorry, in the introduction to, um, in the dedication, I mean, the dedication to the second edition of the Vindication of the Rights of Women, uh, dedicated to Talleyrand, she did not think that a political revolution would ever um, help achieve the aims, the overt aims of the French Revolution, French revolutionaries. She thought that nothing short of a moral revolution would be necessary. And by moral revolution, she meant a complete revision of the key concepts that govern our understanding of individuals, male and female, um, and the world over. So it's, it's a very, she, she doesn't deliver this because the poor woman uh, dies and also uh, belongs to the intellectual precariat. So she's constantly having to try to make some money in one form or other, usually reviewing, and that doesn't bring much. So she, it, she is in a, she really is part of the precariat. Um, but the, the realization that nothing short of our reworking, rethinking, remodeling our fund, the fundamental concepts which uh, shape Western understanding, if no other understanding, was necessary if the world was to become what, in her view, would be a better place. Thank you so much. Yeah, I also think that in your book, it's it becomes very clear how she as a person in um, sort of made possible what she wrote and, and the other way around. And um, yeah, it gets very close to to kind of knowing um, Wollstonecraft. Um, so my next question is, so education, especially education of women has changed drastically since Wollstonecraft's time. Um, do you think her message on education and on education of women in particular still has a relevance today? Well, it depends what you mean by relevance and depends what ideology one is committed to. Um, it, it's not relevant if you don't value contribution to community, to one's community. It's not relevant if you don't think that duties should be fulfilled if one is to uh, merit rights. It's not uh, relevant if you think that character building is not the business of education or educators, however widely understood. It's not relevant if you have anything like a Rousseauian conception of education, one in uh, which one to, character, uh, to caricature it, um, that, you know, that there is a kind of self from within that needs to um, uh, blossom um, independently of social structure um, and um, traditions, um, precepts, that kind of thing. So there are many ways in which it's not relevant if, uh, if you know, given that audience or the public today um, is not uh, particularly open to such notion. Uh, you know, many people 
clamor for rights who never uh, for have a word to say about duties, this would be a, a complete um, aberrance for, for Wollstonecraft. You see, so if you, you have to be effectively a, a, of her mindset to think it's a, it, the education is still relevant. If one isn't any of the things that I've just mentioned, then absolutely she's relevant. Thank you so much. And um, so Wollstonecraft, um, at least in some passages, paints a dark picture of the status quo of the female sex. Um, furthermore, one of her main demands is that women should become more um, like men. How do you see her depiction of the female sex? Well, she doesn't want women to become like men as they are. Um, she doesn't think well of, of men, with some exception, any more than she thinks well of women, uh, with some exception. Um, she, for reasons which have to do with the languages she has to use in order to be understood and the way in which um, virtues have, are identified with um, the via, the, uh, the male, she wants women to, um, to become, to, to acquire the virtues associated with an ideal man. That doesn't mean to say she wants uh, women to, to become like, like men. In fact, uh, she would like men to be, uh, come um, approach or, or seek to approach, endeavor to approach, the ideal man, in other words, the ideal human, rather than male. Mm. Um, so in your book, and this goes uh, very much into the same direction, in your book you show very convincingly that Wollstonecraft's idea cannot be reduced to women's rights, but that her oeuvre is really about women and men about humanity and society and about the need for women and men to change the world together. Um, so do you think there is a specific role for women in this change and how is education and women's education um, important to this? In the 18th century, it was a commonplace that the sexes mutually corrupt and improve each other. So in thinking of both the sexes working together for a better world, she was by no means unusual. Um, the view that the sexes mutually corrupt and improve each other tended to occur within um, texts promoting or advocating the education of women. Um, the role of, of women, so you can't isolate the role of, of, of women in this um, from the role of, of, me, of men. If you look at the Wollstonecraft's own life, you can see that she's an exemplar of a woman um, trying to do what one might say her bit for um, the kind of revolution of morals by which, as I said earlier, she means a, um, a, um, an entire conceptual revolution. Um, so she's an example. Um, she admires the historian Catherine Macaulay. Um, that's another example. So you have examples of, of women doing what she's doing, which is pointing uh, to the incoherence of her society as a critical engagement with the uh, views of her society, a critical engagement with uh, Talleyrand and the French revolutionaries, as I said a minute ago, pointing out that they will never achieve uh, what they say they want to achieve if they don't uh, go much further than they were and um, begin by thinking about education of boys and girls from an early age. So 
individual women can do this, but of course, individual men need to do it as well. Um, so it's not something that um, any number of individuals can do it alone, but the fact that they can't doesn't mean to say that none of us should not endeavor uh, to do our best to contribute to, you know, critical understanding of some of our assumptions. And then at the domestic level, you know, she thinks very much of parenting um, uh, involving fathers as well as, as mothers, not perhaps in the, doing the exact same thing um, in relation to children, but nonetheless, uh, parenting is um, something that both fathers and mothers need to be involved in. Does that answer your question? Um, yes, uh, yes. Um, so, yes, I think so. Um, and um, yeah, I think we can maybe um, discuss some further points in the discussion. Um, I've got some more questions, but um, I also want to later give uh, other people a chance. Um, so um, you show very clearly how uh, women in Wollstonecraft's work are seen just as men are as uh, creatures which can and should turn uh, for the better to strive for this ideal you've been talking about now as well. For Wollstonecraft, the power to complete oneself through reason is a gift of God and the one which effectively elevates the human being beyond animals. And uh, you write, I quote, education stood out among the rights uh, Wollstonecraft demanded for her sex. And then a little later, by a suitable education, Wollstonecraft did not just mean the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, not even one with the addition of the classical education boys and young men enjoyed in school and universities. What she wanted was an education, education that would take women out of themselves in the sense of defying what she took to be the prevailing extreme form of self-centeredness. Yes, it was to be an education that would also turn them inward in the sense of taking them away from the searching for validation in the gaze of others, away from the mirrors of appearances, away from parading themselves. For this, women had to be enlightened, and so did men. And then later you go on. It would be true to say that what Wollstonecraft wanted was the undoing of all that we previously indicated she did not like about women as well as men. She wanted an end to feebleness, idleness, dependence, inequality, pre prejudice, narrow-mindedness, ignorance, and more. Um, would you say the expectation Wollstonecraft has of and for the female sex, uh, this expectation to be a human being of reason, of morality um, can be called true feminism? Um, well, no, I wouldn't say that, not because it's not true feminism, but because there are many feminists, feminists and feminisms. Um, that's her feminism. And it's um, perhaps, I wouldn't even say it, it's her feminism because I don't think it's a category she would recognize. Um, Nothing stops anyone making Wollstonecraft one of the main contributors to the history of feminism. Um, that's up to anyone. But I don't think she thought of herself, because the term didn't exist and, and the movement didn't exist, but I don't think she and, and women who ask for similar things, uh, Lamp de Gouge, and, and, and others um, would have thought of themselves in anything like uh, uh, the way we think of a, a feminist. But of course, even that's problematic because as I just said, there are so many different kinds of feminisms today. But um, it's, it's not true f feminism if we want to use that phrase because it's not there isn't a feminism that um, adheres to all of these views. Um, you know, you can be a feminist and uh, not value work, for example. Uh, Wollstonecraft placed a high uh, value on, on work. This is, you know, 
it's a view uh, Rousseau and um, many authors in the 19th century and, and into the 20th um, wrote in praise of idleness, of laziness. Um, quite often uh, uh, those on the left uh, in, in reaction to, in part, um, industrialization and the work discipline that came with it. So that's just one, one thing. Um, not everyone um, thinks that inequality is, um, captures um, in, uh, adequately um, or indeed should capture the, uh, you know, the feminist movement. So it's, it's, it's a view about what human beings should be like it's composite and there may be some people who will effectively buy into the whole thing or, or, or none and then any position in, in between. But as I said, you know, there are uh, features of her thought which uh, don't sit very well with much of um, contemporary Western thinking. Um, She's not, uh, she's against uh, consumption. She's against luxury. Um, she's against, uh, uh, as you read in the passage before, she, she's against all this um, vanity. Um, she's also very keen on the performance of, of duties, duties uh, to one's uh, children, family, or uh, if one isn't married or doesn't have children, to uh, one's community. And again, this is not everybody's cup of tea today. Thank you so much. So um, in your introduction, uh, you quote Wollstonecraft's uh, touching passage on her daughter Fanny's um, education, her first uh, daughter and uh, she writes you know that as a female I'm particularly attached to her I feel more than a mother's fondness and anxiety when I reflect on the dependent and oppressed state of her sex I dread least she should be forced to sacrifice her heart to her principles or principles to her heart with trembling hand I shall cultivate sensibility and cherish delicacy of sentiment There's Whilst I lend fresh blushes to the rose, I sharpen the thorns that will wound the breast I would fain regard. I dread to unfold her mind, lest it should render her unfit for the world she is to inhab inhabit. Hapless woman, what a fate is thine. Do you think we can learn uh, something about Wollstonecraft, Wollstonecraft's view on women's education or a girl's education from this quote? Um, well, I think what this exhibits is a remarkable honesty for somebody who's written the vindication or a vindication of the rights of woman to say, to write to the father of her child, Imlay, and a, a letter that is to be published um, that she doesn't know whether to educate her daughter according to the principles as set out in her work or in such a way as to be successful in the world as it is. See, um, it's kind of intellectual and emotional honesty that is um, phenomenally rare. So one can learn, I suppose, that um, it's a good thing to be honest with oneself. It's a good thing to be honest with oneself as a parent and as a pedagogue, a teacher. But um, the, the choice, the existential choice that parents um, have to make as to who, to the degree that they control their children or to the degree that they can influence their pupils, you can't learn from that. I mean, that is 
your decision uh, and such as you can make it. You know, do you um, prepare individuals so that they change the world and possibly fail and fail to succeed at all um, and, and might damage them? Or do you um, educate them such that they you know, can climb the greasy pole, to put it very crudely? That's, you know, they're variant on this, but um, there's nothing to learn from that, except that maybe one should be honest and really think hard about what one is trying to do when one is educating a child or a young person. Well, thank you so much. And um, so I'm uh, getting to my uh, last question. And um, this is about um, the, the way you describe uh, Wollstonecraft's era. And of course, it's not only you who describe this era like that, but other people as well. Um, so you write, appearances were everything and they were driven by and exasperated by the desire for material goods. The age was marked by the seamless, endless growth of luxury consumption. Um, so uh, this description somewhat resonates with the descriptions made of our time. And um, so do you think her work is still as actual today as it was then? Well, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, she cast a light. She was not the only one. There were very... Uh, many critics of consumption, luxury, uh, the world of appearance, the, uh, our human, uh, our tendency to gain a sense of ourselves in, through the eyes of others. Um, this is not a theme that died with Wollstonecraft or the 18th century. You see uh, a number of authors engaging with, with this in, in a variety of ways. You can find it, um, I mean, not the anti-consumption, but the uh, creation of the self through the other in, uh, in psychoanalysis, in, in Lacan's work. So um, yes, these are um, profoundly relevant because they're important contributions to the theory of the self, whether they're accurate or not, or um, complete or not, is a different matter. But um, our, the way we think about the self, um, whether you look at uh, Hegel's phenomenology, or um, as I said, um, Lacan or the existentialist, this is part and parcel of um, discussions of personal identity self-consciousness, authenticity. So all of the um, debates in this area of philosophy. Mm -hmm.